Hello and welcome and welcome to Aid and Eyewitness. I'm an independent freelancer, so I can speak out and suggest things that some people might find impractical or outlandish. But that's what I'm here for, to comment, appreciate, criticise and throw out ideas that challenge the norm. In this video I highlight three groundbreaking Manchester buildings which were needlessly destroyed. That's the word used on skyscraperpage.com for all lost buildings. And following examples of reconstruction in Germany, I propose that one of those buildings should be rebuilt. Apologies for the delay in producing this video due to other commitments. Oh, and I wanted to show you this Hacienda mug with artwork based on my photographs of the Hacienda. So to find out more about it, go to Rebuilding Manchester. I'll look them up on Twitter and they've got lots of fantastic archive photos of Manchester. The Hacienda is groundbreaking not for the architecture of the building, but for how the building was reused and transformed into one of the most famous nightclubs in the world. The Hacienda was a revolutionary nightclub founded by Tony Wilson, Peter Saville and others in 1982. They pioneered a type of industrial-inspired design concept that was influenced by Manchester's industrial past. Manchester was at the heart of the Industrial Revolution. The first factories of the world were built here. By the 1980s, most of the old factories had closed, but factory records created a new revolution and the Hacienda was where people could come and be a part of it. Not much is known about the building. Wikipedia states, the former warehouse occupied by the club was at 11 to 13 Whitwood Street West on the south side of the Rochdale Canal. The frontage was curved and built of red Accrington brick. Before it was turned into a club, the Hacienda was a yacht builder's shop and warehouse. When I first went into the Hacienda, I found the interior stunning. The black and yellow striped pillars, the bollards and primary colours were iconic even if the acoustics were not very good. At the Hacienda, there were problems with drugs and the club finally closed down in 1997. The facade now became even more iconic. I photographed it one day in 1998 as I was passing. The building looked great in the sunshine. I read it was to be converted into apartments. I fancied the one on the second floor with the curved wall. But in 2002, the Hacienda building was destroyed. I remember Tony Wilson said, let them tear it down, but I think he got it wrong. An apartment building appeared on the site. It also has a curved facade, but nothing can match the original. I wish it was still there. We can't rebuild the Hacienda, and there's no point in rebuilding it somewhere else. There was an auction of Hacienda memorabilia including bricks, bollards and sections of the dance floor. Groundbreaking and gone forever, except in artworks, on the side of a very attractive mug and in my photographs. If you're interested in the Hacienda and Manchester Music artefacts, go to the Manchester Digital Music Archive www.mdmarchive.co.uk My second groundbreaking building is part of Piccadilly Plaza, begun in 1958 and completed in 1965. I wrote about it in a primary school project. I thought it was, in the true sense of the word, awesome. It was futuristic, dystopian, like something out of a science fiction film. I was fascinated with the smallest of the three buildings, Burnett House. It could have been a building from an episode of Star Trek with a strange roof, a bit Chinesey. In fact, it was a timber structure of hyperbolic paraboloid form. And I took that, ironically, from a web page of the demolition contractors who knocked it down. It was also known as Eagle Star House. I imagine what it would be like to live in an apartment under that roof with its triangular windows. It was eccentric, distinctive, an expression of Manchester's forward-looking ambitions in the 1960s. It survived into the early 2000s, but all wasn't well. The wooden roof needed renovation. Scaffolding appeared, and then the previous owners of Piccadilly Plaza 
destroyed it. It was replaced with a much bigger and much inferior structure. Later, Bruntwood Properties took over Piccadilly Plaza and carried out extensive renovations. I'd like to think they would have renovated Bernard House, but it was already gone when they took over. It shouldn't have been destroyed. Piccadilly Plaza was a flawed but revolutionary building, a product of its time. You wouldn't destroy part of a palace or cathedral and replace it with something modern. Bernard House is gone. The site's occupied, it can never be brought back except by studying photographs and making drawings as I did. They don't have to be good, it's doing them that counts. I found it a great way to re-experience a great building. And now to our third and final building, York House. It stood on Major Street, close to the central coach station next to the Gay Village, directly behind the recently built Brooklyn Hotel on Portland Street. It was constructed in 1911, the work of architect Harry S. Fairhurst. It was groundbreaking as it was a foretaste of things to come, a pioneer structure, a key building in the history of modern architecture. Its shape was totally unique, with a vast stepped back glass facade at the rear. I understand it was used for displaying fabrics. The large sloping south facing windows let in lots of daylight. Just imagine what this building could be used for today. The front facade was conventional, but the rear side was an astonishing piece of architectural innovation, a prediction of the Urbis building, completed 90 years later. York House survived into the 1970s, not the best decade for architecture or urban development, and so Manchester City Council decided in its wisdom to destroy it. I read it was to make way for a new development that was never built. Another source stated it was because of the proposed inner ring road, thankfully also never built. Despite campaigns and pleas by architects across Europe, including the Bauhaus architect Walter Gropius, it was pulled down in 1974. Today, the site is a car park. Nothing has replaced it. But I have a proposal. Let's rebuild York House. It's not a large or overcomplicated building. It wouldn't require too many special skills. It would be a new building constructed to an old design. And to those who say we can't rebuild old buildings, it's living in the past, it's not real. I say Quatsch, rubbish. In Germany, they've rebuilt many buildings, the Kaiser's Palace in Berlin, for instance, and the Frauenkirche in Dresden. Attitudes in Germany seem less hidebound, more ambitious, more forward-looking. A rebuilt York House would be like a time machine, a vision from the past projected into the future. It would be totally unique, a tourist attraction, architecturally a breath of fresh air. It would again be groundbreaking. I hope you found this video interesting, maybe even inspiring. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, post a comment and click the bell button to receive all notifications because I don't have a fixed upload schedule. You can support what I'm doing by buying me a coffee or tea. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash Aiden Eyewitness. Vielen Dank fürs Zuschauen. Many thanks for watching. Auf Wiedersehen. See you again soon.